Okay, time to turn back to rugby. Keith Wood is with us. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Chair. I'm great, thank you. Um, the Telegraph very quickly yesterday, their match report wasn't really a match report at all. It was like, oh, look at this, Ron Nagara, straight to the top of the queue. There's a bit of an issue in that, you know, the uh, the RFU have said that they want to go internal, but they might change their rules for the right candidate. Um, all of a sudden, he's being linked. he will literally be linked with every job, maybe with the exception of the All Blacks game, the All Blacks one. And even then, because of his time down there, they might be like, yeah, come on, sure we'll... We'll at least we'll at least give you a Zoom call. The stock has never been higher for Ron Nagara, has it? No, it's been um, it's pretty uh, pretty extraordinary few days um, for him, you know, because I think everybody, us included, of the unlikelihood of the fact that La Rochelle would actually go and get the win, and um, and so suddenly against all the odds, he wins uh, in his first time as 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 the real boss. Um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing for him. Pretty amazing few days. Uh, look, the the English job thing is uh, that law was going the Telegraph because everybody's searching for a, a lot of people. And a lot of English people don't particularly like Eddie Jones um, or the style in which he's playing. So they're looking for changes all the time. I think Raj needs to look and see what he wants. But if we're being honest uh, about Roman, he's always done it his own way. He has always plotted out what he wanted to do. He has taken the road less travelled um, and he's delivered wherever he's travelled. So uh, I think it makes for a very interesting um, uh, high stool conversation. But um, I think he's an awful lot more to do in the club game yet before he gets to international rugby. The other thing is that um, the La Rochelle job is actually probably his for life if he wants it. And also... It's a brilliant, brilliant job because the expectation was not that they were going to be one of the best teams in Europe as soon as he got the job. But all of a sudden, they're, they're able to do that, which means players who want to play at that level will be more easily convinced to sign for them. The lifestyle is sensational. It's literally one of the nicest parts of the world to live in, but particularly in Europe. It's one of the nicest parts of Europe that you can live in and play top quality rugby. His reputation is through the roof. The style is really interesting. Like they can play any style you want. They will they will mix and match. So whatever type of player you are, you can go there and thrive. And um, you know what? Why would you move now? Well, I think that's I think that's part of it actually. And I, I imagine they're going to want to make certain they can hold on to him, and it'll go a little bit deeper into their pockets. And uh, as, as as for for every successful coach, is what happens. But um, but I was trying to think about this over the weekend in terms of international rugby first. Um, international coaching is often the death knell for coaches. Even when they're successful, it seems like they drop off the face of the earth after after they're gone from it, you know. And uh, you can see the rehabilitation that Stuart Lancaster had to go through um, uh, after after losing the England job in 2015. So it, it does... It, it can be very, very tough. It can also be incredibly frustrating because you only have a limited amount of time with the players and there's only maybe 10 or 12 matches a year. Uh, Raj looks like he's thriving off the pressure of the um, uh, off the amount of time and the influence he's able to impart on a group of players who, um, who look, they've all spoken out really well about him afterwards, you know, and it's been you know, the crazy Irishman and his ideas and what he wants to do and what he believes. And um, look, it looked as if they took every bit of belief that he had. And look, I know Raj a long time. We've had these conversations on here about the doubts that he has and had had at different times. And it's how he went through those doubts. That, like, that's an amazing journey and an amazing lesson to be able to to pass on. And he, he obviously has the skill to pass it on. So... Um, you looked at a team that had lost two finals last year, who had lost Victor Vito, who's probably the most influential player, um, Kerr Barlow, and then the players that come in instead, who haven't played a huge amount of rugby, were phenomenal. So I think he did an incredible job at the weekend. Um, I think his team did an incredible job at the weekend. Um, and they seemed to play very, very smart. But he also said in his post-match interview, which I thought was a study in uh, in how to be gracious in victory. Um, 
he also said this was the start of something. And I don't think it was the start of something for him. It's the start of something for the team. So that's what I read into it. He's also said multiple times in the past that he's a big fan of, of honouring a contract. It is a big deal to him. And he, he does have a deal right the way through until until 2024. So it would take quite the offer for him to, to be ripped away from La Rochelle before then, you'd suspect. Yeah, I think so. And I do actually, I think that's a very important part uh, um, for Raj. And um, I think he likes that idea of building something, of trying to... Um, you know, I can't say have a team following his image because you can't have him and Will Skelton in the same conversation. They look like different species. They're, Will is an absolute giant of a man and my God, was he well able to play. And uh, But they, they, they have the right attitude. They're the same attitude. And um, he seemed to get... I don't know, he seemed to get them to play beyond. I mean, I was trying to have a, a look through the through the game again, not watching it again, but thinking about it again. And um, I, I couldn't quite get over the quality of some of the performances. Uh, Raj had been saying he thinks they have a better 23 and everybody kind of poo-pooed that when, when they heard it. But, um, but actually the big performances on the day, most of the big performances came from La Rochelle. They didn't come from Leinster. Um, and, and that's something that's... Um, they were primed for the final and they were set for the final. And yes, they have big players and all that, but it wasn't just that. It was their players played. And I, I said it last week um, when I was on with Joe that, you know, La Rochelle had to play at their absolute best. Well, they very nearly did. I, I don't know if they could have played a whole lot more. I mean, but who'd be a coach when you see uh, Le Vault on 64 minutes tripping? one of the Leinster players. I mean, who'd be a coach in that? Like, that was the winning and the losing of the game, or so everybody thought at that moment in time. And they still managed to to fight it out for that 10 minutes with 14 players. So, so were Leinster not primed for the occasion? Uh, for Well, for me, Leinster looked a little bit... Um, well, they were definitely off kilter. And I know they were off kilter because of some of the defence. Um, they were off kilter. The line speed was fast, but it wasn't... It wasn't ludicrously fast. Um, I I thought they just whether they were nervous that they definitely weren't complacent, but whether they were nervous, but a lot of the passing didn't go where it has gone all season. And I know that's a factor of the pressure that you're put under, but um, there's a slickness that we're used to seeing in Leinster's um, back play and the interaction, and that wasn't there at all. And I felt that that fed into some of the decisions not to kick to the corner at different times. And in many respects, uh, La Rochelle giving away a lot of penalties, which I think in the first half should have led to a yellow card and didn't. Um, uh, but it, it, in them kicking all the points, it looked as if La Rochelle were happy enough to, to, to do that, you know, to, to accept those three points against them. Uh, and and uh, it it didn't it wasn't as much of just keeping Leinster in the game and like it was nearly the right thing. That's the other point. I mean, you can you can argue against Leinster. I don't think Leinster were at their best. I thought they played. They were a, a bit frozen at different times. They were uh, over anxious, running over the ball. A lot of the passes then were being pulled. So there was a. I mean, it was picked up in commentary, but it happened all the time. A lot of the passes were almost behind them. So that makes life very very difficult. Um, but they nearly had a winning strategy. And actually, it was a winning strategy if it had lasted a bit longer. But the idea of kicking all the kicks at goal actually kept La Rochelle in the game, strangely. So is that the bit that Leinster got wrong in that they went away from... Because, you know, all season long, the ball's in the hands of whoever the out-half is for Leinster and they're kicking to the corner. They're not just taking those points. They're like, we're going to continually build the pressure and if we don't come away with seven now it doesn't really matter because we know that what we're doing is we're absolutely stressing you and, and whatever you do in your defensive line out here we're going to know that the next time and then we'll just get you the next time don't worry we're coming for the seven points and we're going to score those tries early and the game will be over what 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 got into Leinster's head about it being a final and a knockout yeah, cup I'm rugby is there something there yeah I don't I don't know but uh, like normally the ball is before we'd even have a conversation about it, that ball would have been kicked into the corner. You know, the, the, I just felt at times there seemed to be a conflab um, between uh, James Ryan and Johnny Sexton over what, what option are we going to do now? Normally, you don't even think about that. So 
I don't know whether it was they were a bit shell shocked with the scrum, which was very destructive against them. Some of the the line out misfirings or whatever happened, but the confidence that they've had and shown all year ebbed away a little. It still meant they were look, they're still brilliant. You know, they're a brilliant team, and they were again, I say, a minute away from winning. So it's it's. It's hard to fault them, but you can say that they didn't reach some of the heights. Now, maybe that was partly to do with the fact in which the manner in which La Rochelle played. Of course it is. And also it being a final. And finals are, you know, I mean, they fray every nerve. They fray every fan's nerve, but they fray the players' nerves too, you know. And it's, um, uh, I, I don't know. I was I, like, I didn't, even as the game was going along, I just didn't see that Leinster weren't going to win. And maybe that was something that had kind of fit into them, that they can, you know, we can hold this out to the very end. Um, but they just never seemed to get enough of points ahead. So there was always the... Um, he, there was the, just the opportunity for La Rochelle to get a score and get back into the game. Mm. And then it would come down to a very nervous end. And as O'Gara said consistently, they play well in the last 20 minutes. Now, I still think it took a couple of superhuman efforts. I thought Will Skelton staying on for 80 minutes was amazing. Um, I thought her dad was was fantastic, you know, um, um, though I felt he probably, he went off for a HIA, but I thought he was he was out of it. Um, but even at the very end, I mean, Leinster had to get a yellow card at the end and didn't. Um, they gave away far too many penalties there. And I think it would have been the carnage almost, uh, you know, with the amount of noise, if, if that hadn't happened, um, if they hadn't got that score at the end. But I just thought so many of the players, the, the La Rochelle players were... So if you look now, and I, I don't know whether people have done this, but if you look and say, who are the best players on the field? Like, I'll ask you that, sure. Who did you think the best players on the field were? Well, it's Skelton, right? Like... Um, I, I, I don't think Leinster performed. That's why... That's the biggest thing here is that none of the Leinster players you would say so even though they almost win the game you wouldn't say that they were at their best and that's the big concern because this is Ireland really this is the, the backbone of the Ireland team with three players you add in three players and some a much better bench obviously when you get to the Ireland thing and that that's it that, that is important we shouldn't diminish that but you know if you're any of the teams who are going to come up against Ireland in the World Cup or next year's Six Nations the video is detailed the analysis is done and you're like here, 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 here and here and that's how we stopped them and it's quite straightforward now and the, the tape is out and we're a year out from a World Cup and it's like oof this um, this does not bode well I'd say Andy Farrell's looking at this going ah oh, lads come on yeah I look there's a couple of things on that now that are I would say almost reassuring for me, but I just want to go back to the to the the players first and foremost. Dante was fantastic. Uh, Antonio played uh, played his part incredibly well. Uh, uh, Bur the uh, the the hooker was phenomenal. Um, Preso was pretty phenomenal. Gregory Aldrich has been the best player I've seen all year, and actually for the last two years, I just can't get over the quality. Uh, of play that so they're all the standout players for me when you're looking at the game and they're not Leinster guys and they have been Leinster guys all the time that we've been talking previously so um right so the thing that makes me look up from this and say this is mostly the Irish team and this is a template on how to beat them well it's a year out thank god it isn't a month out you know that's that's the, the difference so um, it has been a very uh, influential style of play. It's been a style that um, that I really like myself, I have to say. I love the manner in which it goes about it. Uh, I love the, the sort of diamond shape in around the 10. I love the amount of different ball carriers that are there at the very start that are offloading. But you still have to do it. You can't like, like it as an idea and then kind of clam down a little bit, which I think happened. But also you need other options when that stopped. So what happens when the ball is slow? What other options do you have to use? Uh, what way can you speed it up again? Do you put extra players in to make certain this works at this time? Because that's what La Rochelle did. And when, when they would look at it and say there's only one or two players going in, they'd throw three players in and just slow it down heavily, then get back into a defensive set. So they were in a good place. So like for me, um, Farrell will look at this and say, Okay, this is. We knew this was going to happen. Like nobody has a plan 
that doesn't get out coached at some stage this is how it's out coached what is our counter plan for that so for me a year out from a world cup a year and a half out i say yeah that's pretty decent we can we can we can take all that um and uh but look i think you need other players to, to stand up to it and i i i do think that it was a, a strange day when uh, Keenan had a bit of an off day and he's never had an off day I haven't seen him play badly at all and um, and Johnny wasn't um, totally on fire he had somebody in his eye line every minute you know which which you'd expect um, which you'd expect to happen actually Last question about Sexton then um, we talked about this yesterday in the show with Alan Quinlan is there a point where you just decide that we're going to have Sexton on the field at the end of the game because actually when the game is in the melting pot, we want our best player on the field of play. He can't last, it seems, has has not played 80 minutes very often over the last number of years. So therefore, you can't start him. If you want him on at the end, you can't start him. Is there any world in which we just decide, OK, if we want him to play in the World Cup, for example, all those games in that short period of time, which again, I don't think he's actually ever done, what do we do here? Absolutely no idea. I think the biggest quandary in Irish rugby is is ten and Johnny. And look, I was critical of Johnny a few years ago, but I think he's played fantastically well this year, and he has been pretty much the master of all he surveyed. Um, what everybody now knows, well, very few outhouse play very well under intense scrutiny and pressure every second of every minute, and that's actually what happened at the weekend. And um, you know, there's not, there still isn't guys putting their hand up beside him to say, well, I should be picked instead. That's that's the issue, both at Leinster and at Ireland. Um, there are lots of guys kind of waiting in the wings. They, they have got a fair amount of experience, but maybe they don't have the full level of experience. Um, I just, I look, I think it's a huge risk having a guy that's 37 going at a World Cup. I want him going there, leading Ireland to getting past the quarter final, getting to a semi final. Starting those games, can you see him starting? I don't know. Like... I don't. I actually, I don't know. I just, but you know, it's funny. I kind of argue with and against him on on this one, but he has the desire to play, and nobody has pushed him off that perch. You know, that's. So it's it's just it's an interesting it's an interesting place to be. Really. I just so, think he's more valuable at the end of games than he is at the start of games. Be. Do you know? Look, and, or at least we need to find that out. And the tour to New Zealand has to be the last real opportunity to go. Okay, we're going to start whoever at ten, right? And but Sexton's going to come off for the last twenty five minutes of every game, guaranteed at least twenty five minutes, and sometimes it's going to be half time, and we're going to see what happens. Because so we know, so we at least then have some tape on this is how that works. This is what this is how he performs under those circumstances. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least we'll know. Well, I think I, look. I really think there is there's merit there's merit in thinking of a, of every option at the moment because we need other options and it's just resting on a guy of his age. Um, uh, the last contract offer I got was to be a captain in in Stade Francais for the last twenty minutes of every match. They just wanted a captain to finish the game, and now I was well retired at that stage. I couldn't walk across the road and I might run and play a game of rugby. But you know that was their idea. Um, it was, um, um, uh, you know, the idea was just entirely different. They said, "Look, we don't want you to start the games. So yeah. We just want you to be clear-headed at the end of the game. Yeah, That's what like fresh at the end of the game." I see them. I see the merits in it for sure. Yeah. So I, I, you you would have done well uh, a year in Paris. Maybe you know better even off the field than on the field. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Do you know what it was? It was. It wasn't even tempting. Strangely, I, my um, the, about six months after retiring, my whole body went back to front. Everything went wrong with it. So there was no that wasn't there. This was two years wise. after. Fair enough. Two years after retiring, no, it was right. a very interesting idea. But um, um, yeah, I didn't. Uh, you know, I wanted to actually. I wanted to play there at some stage when I was younger. I can see the allure for for Raj, um, and I have to say for Tonica Ryan, which you know. Oh, yeah. After, out to Tonica, an ex Munchens man and Nina Orman man, um, uh, you know, getting a chance to have an influence. And the forwards did an awful lot of really good work at the weekend. But, you know, to get take that chance, which is it's, it's difficult. I mean, there was, look, there's a lovely image um, um, when Raj came down off the, off the crowd and hugged his wife, Jessie. 
and like they've traveled all over the world for 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 his obsession you know and this is a great marker for 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 a guy who has has done that so i still think he's taken the most difficult path going to new zealand yeah. where they often don't regard us with any real um um they're the exemplars of how the game should be played so there it's rare for them to take the views of other people in now for sure um, and and they embraced him and he has used that to very good effect coming back